Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, it's starting to look a little bit like an amplifier, isn't it? And so far, we were able to talk about our transformer, and we were talk talking about diodes and rectifiers, and we now have our voltage up to the level we need it for our project, and we've converted it from AC to DC. But now the, our next challenge is Yes, it's DC. In other words, the current will only flow in one direction, but that DC is pulsating or it is, all, it is changing, and it's not a steady DC level. In other words, the voltage is going up and down, up and down, and we saw that on the oscilloscope in the last part that we did. So now what we need to do is we need to find a way to eliminate that ripple or that pulsating DC and turn it into a constant DC. So to do that, we're going to use a capacitor, and that's what this video is going to be about, is capacitors. So there are many different types of capacitors out there, and they all share the same basic purpose, and that is to store a charge and to release a charge, but they do it in different ways and they are used in different applications, and the application will determine which type of capacitor you would use, because not every capacitor is suitable for all the applications in which you would use a capacitor, if that makes sense. Now in some ways, a capacitor can act like a battery, in that it can hold a charge, and then it can release that charge into a resistive load, let's say, for instance. So if we measure this capacitor, or this battery here, we have a little 9 volt battery, and if we measure it, it has about 9.4 volts on it. And if we measure this capacitor right now, it has about 4.5 volts on it. And I never even touched this. This has been just sitting in a bin, in my parts bins, for a very long time. And just in the amount of time that it was sitting there, this capacitor charged up. And you can see it has almost 5 volts on it. It has 4.5 volts, and it's a 16 volt capacitor. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> well, this capacitor, as you can tell, has never been used. It's brand new. But a reaction, chemical reaction inside the capacitor called dielectric absorption is what has taken place. In these great big caps, this can happen. This is one of the properties of a capacitor, is that some types of them can actually self-charge. And if we take a piece of wire and try to short it out, we might get a nasty little spark out of this thing. Let's see what it does. Yep, did you hear that little spark? And one thing about a capacitor is once you discharge it, it loses all of its energy very, very quickly. You see how fast that went, just barely touching it? Whereas with a battery, they really don't like being shorted out. But if I just briefly short this battery out, like that, first of all, it doesn't make a big spark, do you notice? No, you didn't see, see? I'm just shorting it out. But even after shorting it like that, it still retains a lot of its voltage. But take a look, it did drop from 9.4 down. And then, as you can see, it's charging back up. So it's recovering. So after a few minutes, it's right back up to nine, over 9 volts, and it'll just keep climbing a little bit over time. And that's because the chemistry of a battery is different from the chemistry, in an, at least in this, it, what's called an electrolytic capacitor. Now this is a property that you see mostly in electrolytic capacitors, and we'll talk about those, because this is what we're going to be focusing on in this video, because this is the type of capacitor uh, that we're going to be using in our power supply. Now we're not going to use this one obviously because it is only good 
for up to 16 volts. It's got really high capacity, very low voltage, and anything above this voltage will cause the capacitor to short out and fail. But it, we are going to use an electrolytic cap. But I wanted to show you that. One of the main differences between a battery and a capacitor is batteries charge up very slowly and they discharge very slowly. Capacitors can charge up very quickly and they can discharge very quickly or very rapidly and they can release an awful lot of current for a very short period of time. These can deliver a lower amount of current but for a longer period of time. Now things get a little different when we deal with supercapacitors and I'm not going to get into those in this video <laughs> because now with modern technology and modern chemistry there are capacitors that can hold large charges and almost mimic that of a battery but they still will discharge faster than a battery. All right, it's been a good five minutes or so since we last discharged this and shot that last little clip. Let's see what has happened to the voltage on the cap just sitting there. And you can see it's already up to about 2 points, or 0 0.26 volts or 266, 267 millivolts. And see, it is climbing. And understand that this meter actually puts a load across that capacitor, a very, very small load, but a load nonetheless. And even with that, and that's called a burden that the, the meter is putting on the circuit. And even with that burden on there, you can see the voltage continues to climb. And that's because of the dielectric absorption of this capacitor. So certain caps are not really good for use in circuits where you are trying to have a consistent voltage or you're going to have a very high impedance circuit or something, these are bad because these will charge themselves up and they'll add their voltage to the circuit. Now, in the, in the application that we're going to use this, this electrolytic capacitor, or actually this one more specifically, that's not going to be a problem. But understand this is one of the reasons why we have different capacitors and all these other ones here these do not have chemicals in them like an electrolytic capacitor does and they don't suffer that problem nearly as much if at all so here's one and you could see there's nothing no voltage and I could sit there all day and it'll never charge up same thing with these ceramic capacitors. And the different, different capacitors use different materials uh, as their electrode and their insulator. Now in our simple homemade capacitors, we're just using aluminum foil and wax paper. But we can use different types of conductors for our electrodes and we can use different types of insulators and each one will give us different properties. Now electrolytic capacitors are different from all these other ones in that these use more of a traditional type of uh, design where you would have an insulating layer that can be anything like mylar or plastic or wax foil or wax paper or uh, it can you can have um, this is mica, uses mica, ceramics, uh, mylar, mica, all kinds of different things. And two electrodes. And the electrodes are just a type of foil that's conductive, whether it be aluminum, copper, steel, whatever, it will be a type of conductor. And those conductors are separated by that insulator and the charge will form on one side you'll get a positive charge and one on the negative or you'll have a negative electrons charge on one side and you'll have a positive charge on the other and they are separated by that insulator so they can't the electrons can't migrate from the one side to the other and the only way to complete that is when you touch the one plate to the other
and then all of a sudden they want to be equal. They, both plates want to be at the same charge potential. So the one with more electrons will transfer its electrons over to the positively charged plate until it's equalized. Now with an electrolytic capacitor it's a little different. You still have a conductive uh, plate or a conductive electrode. However, it is anodized or coated with a special chemical called an electrolyte. Now the, that electrolyte is kind of special in that it's, an, it's a conductor and an insulator all in one. So what it does is it will, it will allow, through electrolysis, it will allow the electrons to collect on one side of it and on the other side it'll be, it'll have a positive charge. So you'll have a difference in charge through that chemical. And the advantage of this is that when that happens, this can store a whole lot more energy in a much smaller area than this. So if you look at this, this is 10 nanofarads. Okay, so that would be 0 0.01 of a microfarad. This is 22,000 microfarads. And you can see there is a size difference, but not that much. Now here's a film capacitor, and albeit it can handle higher voltage, it's only 2.2 microfarads. And this is 22,000 microfarads. So this is basically 10,000 times more capacitance than this, even though they're about the same size. And that's the advantage of an electrolytic capacitor. The disadvantage of this is that chemical will only charge on one side, so it's polarized. You can't connect these backwards. So if you notice, this capacitor does not have a positive and negative. I can connect the positive on either side and the negative on either side, it doesn't matter, and it will work just like a capacitor. If you connect this one backwards, it will actually cause the capacitor to act like a short. It'll short out, it'll damage the capacitor, it'll probably blow, which is what these little creases are for, so the cap can vent, because when, uh, when those chemicals react in there, they can give off hydrogen and other types of gases that can explode and it has the pressure has to go somewhere so it'll blow this thing apart. So I'm using a term over and over again called microfarads or farads. What is a farad? So the word farad is uh, derived from the name of one of the people instrumental in uh, working with this and, and discovering this, and his name was Michael Faraday. So the Farad is kind of a shortened version of Faraday for his last name. Uh, you can look him up. He was a physicist, and he was a British phys physicist back in the 1800s, very famous, and uh, we attribute the, me the, the measurement of capacitors to his name. Now, in order to understand what a farad is, you have to understand what a coulomb is. And a coulomb is a unit of charge. It's your standard international derived unit of electrical charge, specifically. And that standard of electrical charge is the amount of charge that you can deliver with one amp of current flowing for one second. So one amp per sec for one second equals one coulomb. And a farad is one coulomb of charge across one volt of uh, electrical potential. So if you have one coulomb of energy at one volt, you will have one farad. And that doesn't sound like a lot of energy, but it actually is quite a bit of energy. One farad is a million microfarads. <laughs> we don't think about that when we look at these numbers here, but a microfarad is a tiny amount of uh, charge compared to one farad, but yet 
it has a lot of energy. So for instance, this great big electrolytic capacitor, and you can see the size of it, it can charge up to 100 volts at 33,000 microfarads of charge. That's a lot of energy. <laughs> And if you, and this is far less than one farad, is it not? However, if you got across this, these terminals at 100 volts, it would ruin your day. Uh, just so you know, a defibrillator that they use to start your heart when it stops, those, uh, and, and again, the total energy stored in a capacitor is also measured in joules. I'm not going to get into that right now, but those capacitors are only, uh, they only charge up, they're not real high voltage, they're not much more than this capacitor here. And I forget what it is, I should know that because I've worked on them before, but I'm not a biomed tech, I don't work on the biomedical equipment as much, I work strictly with radiation producing equipment. But a lot of my friends are biomeds and they work with those. But the capacitor is not much bigger than this, and they can start and stop your heart with that kind of energy. Now, this one's been sitting on the shelf for a really long time, and I haven't touched it. Let's see what it looks like. I have it on backwards. And you can see there is almost no charge on this capacitor at all. So. This capacitor has a very low dielectric absorption. So this is a really good capacitor. Uh, and conversely, a pretty expensive one at that. And you'll see that, uh, once again, they're both electrolytic. They're both similar in microfarads. But when I discharge this one, it charged back up. And if I look, Look at that, it was 0.2 volts, now it's up to almost 0.4. And this will just keep charging like this indefinitely till it gets up to an equilibrium. Whereas this one, nothing. The point that I'm making is when you're messing with electrolytics, you don't know what kind they are. Uh, and you don't know what their dielectric absorption factor is, and therefore, don't go sticking your finger across electrolytics, even if they've been sitting on a shelf for a very long time, because you could still receive an electric shock. And as well, don't ever connect one of these capacitors to a circuit if you're going to solder it into a board. If it's a sensitive electronics or something, make sure the capacitor is properly discharged. And I've shown you uh, using a little discharge wand with a, you know, a resistor is the best way to handle that. And we can touch this on here and that'll drain that capacitor down and make it safe so that we can connect it uh, when we work with it. But just when you're working with electrolytic capacitors, you need to be extra cautious. Now, that's not to say that, that the film caps can't hold a charge like that as well, but it typically doesn't happen as much as it does with these. Now, as I said before, every form of capacitor has pros and cons. There's strengths and weaknesses to their design, and that's why there are so many different types out there. Uh, some work better at higher frequencies. Some work better at higher current. Uh, some of them uh, are better at storing large amounts of energy in a small area. All have different purposes, and so the application really has to dictate what type of capacitor you're going to use. This is why a lot of times you see you will see some debate online when talking about capacitors. Some people really understand this very well and they can offer us some very good advice as to what to use. What they're saying is true. Other people <laughs> get really uptight and say there is no difference a capacitor is a capacitor. Uh, some people will say that there's huge huge advantages over one type over another when there really isn't. There's all kinds of information out there on the internet today. So I just tell you, do a little bit of research uh, whenever you're choosing a capacitor and if you're designing your own circuit. If you're repairing an existing circuit, it's always best to try to choose a component, you know, whatever capacitor you're using, that has similar characteristics to the one you're replacing. As long as you do that, it should work.
if you go changing one component for a different type, you never know what kind of problems that could introduce into that circuit that was originally working with the original component. Just keep that in mind. Now the reason I have this out there is I did a review of this little LCR meter and neither here nor there whether it's good or bad. In that review I really got into a lot of details about some of the characteristics of a capacitor. Uh, when we talk about things like theta, uh, you know, the phase angle, we talk about ESR, we talk about leakage, all these different characteristics of a capacitor are very important. Dissipation factor, uh, dielectric absorption, as we saw in this, all of those things come into factor on this. So I would suggest go back and check that review out, even if you don't really care about this. This was just a cheap meter. Um, but it, it will give you some insight as to why there are different types of caps. What I think I'm going to do is at the very end of this video, I'm going to tack on the end the footage that I recorded of making these caps and just doing a couple little tests on them. And we actually compare them to a uh, mylar capacitor like this. If you want to stay and watch that at the end of the video, feel free. But I'm going to put that at the end. Okay, getting back to the schematic of our amplifier. Uh, <sighs> Wait, I have another one. I have another one. Let's do a green one this time. Okay. This one wants to keep falling. All right, so we come out of our diodes and we have that ripple. And that terrible 100% ripple that we have is now going to go in and it's going to charge this first capacitor. Now, remember what we said, a capacitor can charge very, very quickly. And as long as you can supply enough current, a capacitor can charge very quickly. If the current is limited because of the resist, the internal resistance of the capacitor or because of the resistance of the circuit feeding it, then it will charge at a certain rate uh, based upon that current. And we can, we can calculate that through a math formula called the RC time constant. A time constant is kind of a, a measurement of how fast the capacitor is going to charge up to a certain voltage, if that makes sense. So let's look at the formula real quick. All right, an RC time constant is simply, and I, I'm kind of paraphrasing this a little bit, it's the time that it takes for a capacitor to charge up to about 63%, and it's a little bit above that, of the voltage that you're applying across it. So one time constant, so if you put one volt across a capacitor, in one time constant it will charge up to about 630 millivolts, if that makes sense to you. And that's an internationally agreed to standard, or an SI standard. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to show how we can calculate this, because RC Okay, time, a time constant is signified by the letter tau. Tau is a Greek letter, and it looks kind of like this with my poor drawing, <laughs> and it equals R times C, where R is ohms, resistance, and C equals farads, capacitance. Okay, and you got to make sure that the units you, you, you keep, so a lot of capacitors are in microfarads or nanofarads, and you have to make sure you keep your decimal in the correct place. Now what I have is a little circuit here that I built. And let's back out. <laughs> I just threw it together on the bench real quick. I'm using a 9 volt battery. So we have a 9 volt battery, and we're going through a one point, what is it, a 1.2 K resistor. 
and then we go into our capacitor and it is an electrolytic capacitor by the way and then we're going through a switch so let's draw a little switch in there so essentially when I flip the switch it completes the circuit current will flow through this resistor through the capacitor and charge it so we're applying a voltage from here to here and it's going to be uh, of course <laughs> With no load across here, even though this resistor's in here, it will essentially be close to the 9 volts that's in there. But as soon as you put any kind of a load across here, and this is a changing load because it's a capacitor as it charges, this voltage will drop substantially. And actually, in the beginning, this capacitor acts as a short. So there will be almost 0 volts across here. And then as current begins to flow, the voltage will begin to rise until the voltage here equals the voltage here. And remember, one time constant okay, will equal about 63%. At the end of one time constant, you'll be at 63% of our total voltage. So we're going to do the math on this. There's a reason we're going through all this trouble. So the first thing I've done is I measured a little more accurately this resistor because this is not a hundred you know perfect resistor so it's a 1.2 K because of the red red brown color bands but when you measure it it's actually 1188 ohms the capacitor is a 10 microfarad capacitor and it actually measures out at about 10.45 microfarads now if we do the math Let's go through it. RC equals your time constant. And that's going to equal 1188 times 10 microfarads, which is 0 0.00001045 farads, right? So if we do that math, that time constant comes out to about approximately 0.0124 seconds or 12.4 milliseconds. Okay. So let's now connect our scope. You can see I have an oscilloscope probe here and it's pretty high impedance because I have the times 10 enabled and I have my little wired up circuit here like this and I'm going to go up to the scope and I have the scope set to trigger and then hold the what's happening you know hold the actual signal after it triggers now I have this shorted out because once again we don't want any of the uh, dielectric absorption to take place so I'm holding this down as much as possible so as soon as I lift this off I'll flip this switch and you'll see the scope will trigger. So let me get you up here on the scope and you can see all my reflection and everything on there. All right. Hi everybody. How you doing? And click. And there it is. So you can see at the beginning this is your voltage and this is time. So we're looking at time versus voltage on the oscilloscope. Let's use our fun pointer, huh? So down here is zero volts, and up here is our maximum volts. Let's use our cursor. And the first thing I want to do is kind of scroll over. Let's set this first one at zero volts, and right at the right where it starts to rise, go to the other one, and we're going to go all the way up to the top, and we're going to measure the maximum voltage. So here it is fully charged over here. And we can see our voltage there is about 9.28 volts. So I'm going to write that down. 9.28. 9 and if we do the math, 9.28 times 0.63 equals 5.84 volts or 5.85 volts let's say so 5.85 volts is where it would have gone through one time constant 
So let's move this down to where it goes to 5.85 volts. Five point, there's 5.84, that's pretty close. And if we look at the time, our delta time is about 13.1 milliseconds. And we calculated using what we had that it would be about 12.4 milliseconds. So we were within one millisecond. And of course that tiny little difference is probably due to the switch and the wiring and all that uh, that we were seeing. And we are measuring 5.84 instead of 5.85. So once again, or no, that would make it a little bit longer. So you could see very, very close. And that's what a time constant is. Now that we've had a little visual experiment of what a time constant is, let's look at this chart and you can see just as there is a time constant for the capacitor charging, and you can see as it charges, the voltage increases, but the current decreases. So if we actually measured across the resistor and did the math, we could have seen the actual current drop. And same thing. Now, just as there's a time constant for charging, there is the same time constant applies to discharging. So when we have our resistor, uh, or our, our load, which is, acts as a resistor, namely in this case will be our amplifier, that capacitor is going to be discharging. And here's the thing. When you have a load across this, this was an unloaded capacitor. In other words, we didn't really have, if you look at that little drawing that we made, where did I put it? Right here. There was no load across this capacitor. But let's say we have our amplifier that kind of acts like a resistor. So what's happening is this, this circuit is charging the capacitor and the capacitor really wants to charge but this resistor is discharging the capacitor. So you have this side of the circuit and this side of the circuit kind of fighting over that same capacitor. One's discharging it while the other's charging it. And as long as this thing has high enough current, it has a higher current than this resistor will draw, then that voltage will eventually get up to your peak voltage and it'll just stay there like that. But what's going to happen is if this is discharging at a faster rate that this can charge, then our voltage is never going to get up to the maximum voltage. Now, when we start dealing with a sine wave or a ripple current, like we have with our rectified signal, like this, well, what's going to happen is, as this capacitor charges, then you're going to see the voltage start to go up with it according to that con time constant. That time constant is going to come into play with that and eventually the capacitor will charge. Now when the capacitor charges you have that load on there and that load is going to, while this is dropping down, that load is going to start discharging the capacitor. So essentially what you're going to have happen is our voltage is going to go up with this and then the load is going to start discharging it until finally it, it catches this peak coming back up again and then it'll recharge it and then it'll drop down. So you'll see this little bit of ripple at the top and that's called an unregulated power supply. Essentially it's at the mercy of how much load you're putting and how big the capacitor is and how much charging you can apply to it. Now I think some of you who are really thinking ahead on this can see where I'm going to go with this. And I did this, I did a whole video on this on why it's diminishing returns on putting a bigger filter capacitor on your power supply of your amplifier. At some point in time, that capacitor can no longer, uh, having a bigger capacitor isn't really going to make any difference.
all it's going to do is it's just going to take longer for it to initially charge up but once it's charged then it's not going to make any difference so if I have if I have enough capacitance that this this ripple is very very tiny doubling the capacitance isn't really going to reduce that ripple by a whole lot it's going to just change it by a tiny little bit and each time you get bigger in capacitance it makes less and less of a difference in the, the height of this ripple so and then some people say well the capacitor acts like a storage bank for uh, high peaks well that is true to an extent um, but once again if you have too long of a peak and you don't have enough current in your power transformer to recharge the capacitor you're still going to have ripple in there so there's kind of that sweet spot and that's typically what most manufacturers look for when they're designing their amplifier they'll go a little bit over so that if the capacitor drops value with age it still will be working fine and that's also where people can cut corners very low cost amplifiers they'll often use the bare minimum capacitor that's needed to get rid of the ripple and no more so if that capacitor starts to age and the ESR or something changes in it it's going to affect this so keeping that in mind that's really what we need to know when it comes to choosing the correct capacitor for our circuit Okay, let's walk through this. We have an amplifier here, and this amplifier is somewhere in the line of, let's say it's a 12 watt amplifier. And that means this output section will deliver 12 watts of power to the speaker. Now, the circuitry before this needs a little bit of power to, to drive it as well. So let's just round it up to one watt. Let's just say the driver section uses one watt and this one uses 12 watts. So this whole amplifier is gonna draw about 13 watts from the B plus. And we have two amplifiers. So 13 watts times two is gonna equal 26 watts. So keep that in mind, we need 26 watts of power. So if we look up here, Here's our math. Remember, at least on paper, it's 230 volts RMS. We have to figure out the peak voltage, which is 1.414 times the RMS. So 230 volts times 1.414 equals 325.2 volts. You follow me so far? Now, because at any given time, these voltages are going through two diodes you're going to experience two let's say roughly 0.6 volt diode drops so you're going to have a, a total diode drop loss here of about 1.2 volts and remember with our vacuum tube uh, rectifier it was more like 50 volts but in this one it's only 1.2 volts so if we subtract the 1.2 volts from that you're going to come up with 324 volts peak and it's going to have this ripple on it that's going to be 120 hertz. So you see this little dotted line I put down here? So here's the zero volts, and we're going from zero to 324, and then zero to 324. But if you remember, this, when this was an AC sine wave, before it went through its rectifier over here, it was going up to the peak and then negative to the peak. But since we full wave rectified it, you just have 120 pulses every second. Okay, and we saw that on the video. We saw this on the oscilloscope. 
Now, that voltage is going to be fed across the capacitor and across our load resistor. And we drew a resistor here to be representative of the load that that amplifier is going to present to the power supply. So we know we have two 13 watt amplifiers that are both drawing power from the single power supply. So 13 plus 13, you have a total of 26 watts. And if we want to know how much current is flowing through this, which we're going to need to know that, you just simply do Ohm's law. Current is going to equal your power divided by your voltage. So we have 324 volts peak. So we take 26 watts divided by 324 volts is going to equal 80 milliamps. So that means that our amplifier, when it's running at full power, is going to require about 80 milliamps of current to be able to feed this with the amount of power it needs to get the full output. Now, you always want to leave a little room for margin in there. You don't want to run anything at its absolute maximum. So let's figure that we need about 100 milliamps. And if you recall, the transformer that we're using is good for up to 200 milliamps. And I'll show you that here. Let's take a look. So if we look right there, it says 230 volts, 0.2 amps or 200 milliamps. So we have more than enough. So we're even just going to run this transformer at about half its maximum rating. So 100 milliamps. Now, the math formula to determine what capacitor, let's just say for the sake of simplicity, we only need this one capacitor. The rest of these we're not going to worry about. Okay, We're just looking at the amount of current that we're going to need to feed into this circuit in order for this to work. Now, the capacitor is going to affect how much ripple current we have. And we looked kind of on the scope, and you can tell when that capacitor charges up, it's going to charge up on this first cycle. And then that 100 milliamps of current draw is going to immediately start draining the capacitor as this, as this voltage ripple starts to drop down. But it's going to kind of fill in the gap. So if we draw this a little bigger, so you have something like this. And what's going to happen is the capacitor is going to charge up and then it's going to start to drop off as this drops. The capacitor is now handling everything until finally this builds back up and it recharges the cap. Then the cap is going to start discharging again and so forth. This is, this is the actual ripple voltage. So from this point to this point is, the, is your V ripple. And we want to usually keep that at a minimum. Uh, so for this 325 or 324 volt supply, if we have one or two volts of ripple, that's not really going to hurt anything, especially at the very beginning of the amplifier. That ripple will get reduced as it goes through the rest of the, of the capacitors. But right now, let's just make sure that we're somewhere around one or two volts ripple. And knowing that, information, we can now use this formula. The capacitor in farads is equal to the amount of current that our load is drawing in amps times the frequency, which is your mains frequency. So in other words, this is running on, we have 60 hertz mains here in the United States and 50 hertz mains, so you would use 50 uh, over in Europe, times the ripple that you want, the ripple voltage that you want or desire. And this is for a half wave rectified signal. Because remember, with half wave, you only have one pulse per cycle. And then it's clipped, the other half, half cycle is clipped off at zero volts. Then you have another pulse and then another pause. But with a full wave rectified, you're actually getting two pulses per cycle. So you actually, your 60 hertz mains gives you 120 pulses. That's why for a full wave rectified, 
it's the same formula except you take two times the frequency and that's why so let's say we want one volt of ripple uh, with 60 hertz mains so our capacitance in farads is equal to 0.1 and I screwed up here this isn't easy to, so I'd redrew it here it's hard to see that is 0.1 volts time or 0.1 amps or 100 milliamps from over here divided by 2 times our frequency which is 60 Hertz so that's going to be 120 Hertz times 1 volt of ripple that we want and if we do the math it comes out to about 833 microfarads so you need a lot of capacitance for this to stay up there now if we want our ripple to be even higher let's say 2.5 volts we can take the same formula and just plug in the 2.5 so you take 100 milliamps divided by 2 times 60 Hertz times the 2.5 volts of ripple and that's going to equal look at that and what capacitor did they give us so if all these voltages are the same and they're not going to be because instead of 110 volts we're putting 121 volts in there this is going to be higher this is going to be a little different uh, so the current is going to be different because of that and as the current is different then it's going to throw us off but I bet you we're going to be pretty close to this and this is why they chose this value so whoever designed this amp did some math didn't they all right so to do our test we want to come up with a resistor that we're going to put in our power supply that's going to take the place of the amplifier once it's all connected up so to do that it's pretty simple it's Ohm's law once again you're going to take resistance of the load resistor is going to be the voltage which is 324 volts divided by the current which we determined to be hundred milliamps and that's going to equal 300 or 3240 ohms or about 3.2 K So we need to put a big heavy duty 3.2K resistor in there and it's going to be a lot of wattage that it's going to draw. It's going to be 26 watts. So you need a pretty hefty resistor to do this test. But we're going to put that load resistor on our power supply and we're going to look at how it affects uh, the voltage up on the scope. Now we looked earlier at what it looked like with no load on it. and here we go we have these resistors and this is actually uh, let's see here actually about 3750 ohms so the resistance is a little bit high so our current is going to be a little bit lower but that's okay it's going to be close enough for testing purposes so we have the resistor connected and we have the uh, let's we have the scope connected now let's look at the scope and I'll plug everything in and we'll turn it on and see what it looks like and really what we want to see is what kind of ripple voltage we have All right, plugging it in, and here we go. And you can see right now, we have approximately 322 volts. So that's the real amount of voltage with that kind of load on it. And there's ripple, but we can't really see it because it's riding on top of that 320 some volts. So now what we're going to do is we're going to change our oscilloscope and we're going to look at the 
just the AC component. We're going to take the DC component off of it. Let me set the scope. Okay, I just stopped the scope so that I could turn the power off so the resistor doesn't burn up. But here is our ripple voltage. And remember we calculated that we, for about 2.5 volts of ripple, uh, we should have a 333 microfarad capacitor and so forth. So we have a 330 microfarad capacitor. The current is a little bit different, uh, but it's close. And look at what the ripple voltage is right there. 1.92 volts. So you have just about 2 volts of ripple, just like we calculated. So when they designed this amplifier, they designed it to have about 2 volts of ripple. Now if I change that capacitor, it would change the amount of ripple, but not as much as you might think. I could add another 330 microfarad capacitor in series, or in parallel with that, and you would be surprised that it's not going to make that big of a difference. Because remember, when we did the math, going almost but not quite triple the capacitance, going from 333 to 833 microfarads, only dropped it from about 2.5 volts of ripple down to just one volt of ripple. So really, to get that down anymore, you're going to need tons of more capacitance and it's hardly going to make any difference. And this is why when people always ask me, you know, uh, my amplifier has on the, on the main power supply, it has uh, 4,700 microfarad capacitors. And what if I put a 20,000 microfarad capacitor on there? Well, it would reduce the ripple by a tiny little amount. <laughs> as you can see there. And it doesn't really matter what the power supply is. It does, in other words, the, the ripple has nothing to do with the power supply voltage itself. So this is a 325 volt power supply. But if it was a 12 volt power supply and we used all the same capacitors and the same had the same amount of current flow, you'd get the same ripple voltage. I know that sounds crazy, but the math formula proves it. It doesn't care. It only cares about what the ripple voltage is and not what the actual voltage is of the power supply. It doesn't care what voltage its DC component that it's riding on. It only cares about the ripple itself. I hope this shows that. Now just so you understand, increasing the load will increase the ripple. So if I put a lower resistance in there and draw more current from the power supply, this ripple will get bigger. And if I take put less current in there, I will get less ripple. And the DC component will go up a little bit as well. So everything's a balancing act. When you have an, a linear and unregulated linear power supply like this, these are the kinds of things you deal with, so you really have to do your math to make sure you're choosing the correct components for the power supply to be able to properly feed the, the correct voltage and current to the circuit that you're trying to feed. Does that make sense? Now if you take a look at this power supply here, they did something else. We have our main capacitor here and we already determined that it's capable of what we're trying to do. But then they go through a very low resistance resistor, or a relatively low resistance, only 75 ohms, but it's huge wattage, 25 watts. And then look at that. They go through a second 330 microfarad capacitor. What do you think that's going to do? Now the next part of this might be a little bit more than Electronics 101 and a half. Maybe it'll be almost Electronics 101 and three quarters. And that is this Pi network. Designing these Pi filters is a little bit, can be a little bit challenging, but we're going to try to break it down and keep it as simple as possible. Now people take power supplies for granted, especially when you're designing a tube amplifier or even a solid state one. But really the power supply is the heart of the, of the machine. If, if you don't have a good power supply feeding your amplifier, the rest of this is no good.
power supplies change with load. Um, that's just a fact, unless it is a highly regulated power supply that can, you know, you know, provide a constant current and voltage and all that. But these linear power supplies that are like this, they will they will vary based on the the amount of load that you present to them. And you have to kind of figure that into your whole circuit. And there's a lot of things that we do with estimates. You can calculate as accurately as you want, but there's always going to be little situations that you kind of want to overcompensate a little bit and design your power supply to be able to, to deliver a little bit more than it's ever going to need to deliver. Number one, that's going to help keep the components from overheating. And number two, that's going to allow for some variables that you are going to have in an amplifier. Remember, an amplifier is designed to drive a reactive load. That load changes, and therefore the current that the amplifier is going to draw from the power supply will vary. And it'll vary quite a bit, uh, both in voltage and current and so forth. So let's kind of break this down. What we first did was we checked our ripple current uh, and we calculated that and we looked at that little formula and we determined that this is the correct capacitor for the circuit that it's going to be driving. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to refine it even more. If you remember, we have about two volts of ripple on here still. And really, for driving the output section, that's not a big deal. And as a matter of fact, that ripple voltage will cancel itself out when you're using a push-pull configuration like this. But more about that when we get into the output section and talk about the design of this. But for right now, we're going to use this network of two capacitors and this resistor in between them to even further reduce the amount of ripple till it's almost non-existent right here. And we're actually going to connect that load to here after we build this and we're going to see if it works as the way that we're calculating it. Now the first thing we need to do is we have to know the math behind this to see what this is going to do. I'll try to kind of break this down to make it a little easier to understand. Okay, so we made this little drawing to hopefully make it as easy as I can. And again, I'm not a math professor, so probably don't teach this very well, but this represents our power transformer. You can see right here, and our bridge rectifier, which is right here. I just drew the quick version. And if you recall, the ripple voltage was our current, which we estimated around 100 milliamps, divided by 2 times the frequency, which is 60 hertz in this case, times the capacitance in farads. So this turned out to be 0.1 time divided by 260 or 2 times 60 times point. 0033 and it came out to be about 2.5 volts of ripple. If you recall that's roughly and we measured it that way right so when we put the oscilloscope on there it was around 2 to 2.5 two volts of ripple using our 3.2k resistor that we calculated uh, it would be a representative resistance of what the two amplifiers themselves would look like to the power supply. Now, in order to figure out this, what this network is doing, there's a couple, thing, couple directions we can take. We can solve for the resistor if we know how much we want to reduce the ripple by, or we can, if we know the resistance and the capacitance, we can figure how much it's going to reduce the ripple. <laughs> so we can work it either way. Now in this case, this amplifier already has that in there. So we're going to use these two numbers to calculate the ripple reduction factor. So our ripple reduction factor, in this case, is going to be W squared times that resistance times that capacitance. So the W just stands for 2 times pi times the frequency. 
2 pi times, in my case, it's 60 hertz because it's 60 hertz mains over here. So 2 pi times 60 is going to be 377. So go down here. 2 pi 60 is 377. And remember, it's W squared. So square that times our 75 ohm resistor times our 330 microfarad capacitor. That's going to equal... 142129, so 142,129 times 75 times 0 0.0033 equals a reduction factor of 3,517 and some change. So that is going to completely wipe out <laughs> the ripple. Now, if we take our original 2.5 volts of ripple that we calculated back here, the ripple at this point is going to be the, uh, the ripple over here divided by the factor. So if we just take that 2.5 volts, divide it by our ripple reduction factor, we come up with 0.7 millivolts of ripple. And that's all we're going to have here. So that's going to be really quiet right there now. Now the other thing is this resistor is now in line in series with our amplifier. Our amplifier kind of looks like a 3.2K resistor to our power supply, remember? Because we calculated that based on how many watts and everything. So if you take our voltage, which if you recall from earlier was 324 volts, and we divide that by 3,275, then we're still going, you, we're only going to lose about one milliamp. So you can see this resistor serves to really reduce the amount of ripple. However, it's not really going to reduce the current a whole lot. It's not going to limit the current by that much. So you can see how this works. And in vacuum tube rectifiers, this would be replaced with a coil, you know, a choke coil, instead of a resistor, which is going to be a lot more uh, efficient because it's going to have lower resistance and still have a higher reactance to this. It's a, it's a reactive component. So it could do this same job and pose a lower resistance to this circuit. But since this is you know, this is a solid state circuit. This Pi network with the resistor should work just fine. And that's why they're doing it. The math works out, and you can see why they chose what they did. And notice, even even with that, just that small voltage drop across this resistor that you're going to have, there's only going to be a couple volts across there, they're still putting a 25 watt resistor in there. So it's still going to handle, you know, a little bit of uh, current and ha dissipate a little bit of power. And we can calculate that. I mean, if there's, let's just round it off again to 100 milliamps. Um, 100 milliamps, V or E equals IR. So we take 0.1 times 75. You have about 7.5 volts times 0.1. About three quarters of an amp of a watt. So you got a 25 watt resistor with three quarters of a watt. That resistor should run very cool. So let's see. Let's build this. Let's add this part, and let's see if all of this goofy math that's confusing actually works out. Okay, I just very precariously jumpered everything together, and it's turned on. And if you look, there's the resistor down there and the other capacitor. And if we look up at the oscilloscope, you can see it's bouncing around because I'm set to AC coupling. But you can see there's almost virtually no ripple. I'm down at 200 millivolts per division, and I don't even have 10 millivolts. There's just nothing there other than noise that the 
that the times 100 probe is picking up. I'm going to shut this off right now. And the that 25 watt 75 ohm resistor is absolutely ice, ice cold. And this resistor here is really, really hot because <laughs> it's dissipating a lot of energy. So you can see it worked exactly like we calculated. And that's good news. And looking at our voltage now, we're now down to about 310 volts. So there's probably about a, a 10 volt, 312. It's bouncing around a little bit. So about a 10 volt drop, give or take. Okay, as you can see, we have the second capacitor and the 75 ohm resistor mounted officially. And right now I have the oscilloscope looking at the first capacitor, so right here. And if we turn the power on, we go up to our oscilloscope and let it settle here for a second, because it's on AC coupling. You can see the ripple, and we're on 500 millivolts per division, so 500, about 1.5 volts of ripple give or take. Anywhere from 1.5 to 2 volts of ripple. And remember, we, cal we calculated somewhere around 2 volts. Now let's move the scope over to the other side, which now will be this capacitor over here, the second one on the other side of the resistor, and let's see what the, what the ripple looks like on that. And you can see the ripple is almost zero. I mean, it's very, very, very small. And this is going to kind of float around here because of the high input impedance of the scope and because of the times 100 probe and all that. But you can see there is absolutely no uh, AC ripple on there. All right. So I think you get an, a good idea of how well this little Pi filter network functions. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to everything. And again, you can replace this resistor with a inductor, but the inductor is going to be pretty big. It's almost going to look like a transformer because it has to be iron core to get the, the size <laughs> and the amount of inductance that you need to carry that kind of current. So usually a, uh, an LC Pi network like that, you're not going to see that in anything where there's heavy current. So normally where you would have that is where the inductor would be delivering low current for like the output or the driver tubes and things like that. And you would take your output transformer and you'd connect it over here before the inductor. So the high, heavy current would be on this side of it. Uh, they did not do that in this instance. I'm not sure why. Again, we'll get more into why you really don't need a heavily filtered signal for the output transformer. But people, it's, it can be very confusing how these things work, but when you really break it down, all this is, is an RC time constant. And that's why we kind of looked at that first. All these filter networks are, is RC time constants that are kind of daisy chained one onto another. So if we look again, we come off of here, and it goes through this resistor and through another capacitor. This is another time constant. So this is going to filter it even more. But in addition to being a filter, uh, or a frequency uh, low-pass filter. It is also acting as a voltage divider. So this resistor not only will reduce the ripple to the power supply, but it will also drop voltage. So as the current flows through this resistor, this resistor is going to limit that current because it's some of that energy is going to be converted from electrical energy into heat energy and then what comes out here on the other side is going to be a reduced voltage. Now here's the disadvantage 
to a non-regulated linear power supply like this. All of this is extremely load dependent. So if I put a heavier load on this, this voltage at each of these points is going to change. So if this is sitting at idle and it is drawing a quiescent current of, you know, uh, let's say 100 milliamps for the, for the two amplifiers together, all of these voltages will be what we're calculating at that point. But as soon as you turn the volume up on your amplifier, these are going to start drawing more current as it has to deliver that current to this load here, to this speaker. And as the current goes up, the voltage is going to go down. It's, it's just Ohm's law. If the resistors here don't change, because these are fixed resistors, and I put more current here, then I'm going to have less voltage at this point. So it, it, this is a, not a regulated supply. It will move around. And even on transistor stereos, I mean, you may not, under, you may not have thought about this, but if I take that oscilloscope and I put it across the output of the power supply, for instance, on a big Marantz or Pioneer or whatever transistor amplifier, as soon as I start cranking the volume up, you're going to see the DC voltage. It might be sitting at 65 volts or something. It may be a real high current power supply, but as soon as you start cranking the volume up and delivering energy into that dummy load or into the speaker, you will actually see the DC rail drop at those peaks. And the idea is they set that voltage to be higher than what you need to get the rated power out of the amplifier. So they calculate this into the formula. In other words, you want this voltage and everything to be higher than you need so that when you are drawing maximum current and this voltage drops, it's still providing the amount of voltage you need to get the maximum power out to this speaker. So there's a lot that goes into planning a power supply for a stereo, especially when it is going to be an unregulated power supply. Now with a regulated power supply, it doesn't matter. As long as that regulated power supply's current rating is high enough to provide the current you need when everything's all maxed out, it really doesn't matter. But when you're using an unregulated linear supply like this, you have to take all those things in consideration because voltages are going to change with current. And the stiffer you make this power supply, in other words, the, the bigger and heavier the windings, the lower the resistance, all that stuff, yes, it will drop less, but it still will drop and you will be able to measure it, especially if you're using an oscilloscope or something sensitive of enough to actually see it. So I think that's enough <laughs> to talk about when we're talking about uh, capacitors and filter networks when it involves these linear power supplies in these types of amplifiers, these unregulated supplies. So I hope you learned a few things on this, and I sure did. I enjoyed doing this and kind of reviewing it and looking at it again. And I'm going to close this video out right here. I think we have enough information. I know my brain hurts right now. So until next time, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again real soon with the next part. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Now, the first thing we want to do is we cut the electrodes so that they're slightly larger in one dimension and slightly smaller in the other dimension than our insulator. And we want to position our insulator in such a way that we prevent the two electrodes from being able to touch one another. So you can see right here what we're doing. And it'll be just like that. Now this is going to be kind of fidgety to do around a camera, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out this little popsicle or this little tongue depressor stick to the same width as this insulator. And then I'm going to wrap this around there just to kind of hold it all in place. And then we're going to cover it with some tape. Okay, here's our little homemade capacitor. And as you saw, and there was one piece missing because it got wrinkled up, I had to make another one. But there was, there's a piece of aluminum, which is your first electrode, a piece of wax paper, 
which is your insulator, then another piece of aluminum, which is the other electrode, then another piece of wax paper, so that when you roll this up, the, the one foil doesn't roll up on itself and short itself out. So you basically have four layers, two that are electrodes and two that are insulators. And I just kind of tightly, as best I could, wrapped it around here. Now, you can use tape to hold them together, but the tape be becomes part of the insulator and it will affect the performance of the capacitor. And this is the simplest little type of cap you could make. <laughs> and by making it shorter or longer, by making the strips longer and wind more turns around there, you can change the capacitance. So let's see what this one reads at. This was, conversely, these were two pieces of aluminum that were three inches by three inches square. And of course, not all of that three by three, which would be nine square inches, not all of that uh, size was is actually being a capacitor. Because remember, part of this, about a half inch on either end, is overhanging the insulators, and those become your contacts. So really, you only have about a two inch or two and a half inch uh, section of aluminum that's actually being a capacitor. So we have our little friend here, the LCR meter. And I have it set to check capacitance. And we'll connect our leads. Oh, can you see that? There we go. And you can see this is about a 2.2 nanofarad or a 0 0.022 microfarad capacitor. Pretty cool. And the quality factor is 49. Dissipation factor is 0 0.020. And the R theta, which is the, the phase angle is minus 88.8 and in a perfect ideal capacitor this would be minus 90. Because this has a little bit of uh, either a resistive or an inductive component to it, it affects the phase angle so it's not going to be perfectly 90 degrees. But what you're going to find is these foil capacitors like this will usually have a pretty good theta. and if you look at some of the electrolytic capacitors and so forth, you'll see this number will actually go down. It'll, it'll be further away from minus 90 degrees. Anyway, we're checking this at, a one, at one kilohertz test frequency, and we can change that too. And if we go to 7.8, you can see the capacitance changes a wee little bit, but it stays pretty close. It's still 2 nanofarads. You can see R theta gets better. Quality factor goes up. And then if I go down to 100 hertz, <laughs> you can see it's having a hard time locking in, but 2.2 nanofarads. And you can see the theta gets a little bit worse. And a lot of that has to do with the dissipation factor of the capacitor. And we talk about this Go back and look at this, the video, the review I did on this meter, and I explain what some of these things are. Okay, I have one that's a little bit longer now, and it should be a little bit higher capacitance, and it's not quite double the length and the same width. And what I'm going to try to do is I'll try to do this on camera. I've taped the front edge down, and then we can pull that tape off when we get this rolled up a little closer. And I'm using this little matchstick instead of the flat tongue depressor. And the reason we're going to do that is we talk about the outside foil and how it can pick up AC or it could pick up a capacitively couple hum into the, into the circuit. Well, this allows more surface area when it's this way. So you can see how much open surface area there is of this outside foil winding around here. But with this one, it'll be so narrow, there will be significantly less 
And that's one of the reasons that some of the modern capacitors today don't really have a problem with the outside foil that the older ones did. First of all, this wax paper is similar to what they used in the old capacitors in the old days. The new materials that they have in the insulators are much thinner now, but they have a better dielectric constant than these do. And so, as a result, the outside foil is extremely thin and it's extremely a small surface area. So, that kind of mitigates the, uh, the problem of that outside foil thing. So, let's see if we can wind this on camera. It's hard to get it started. Once you get it to kind of wrap around itself once or twice, it gets easier, but these first couple turns get very difficult. And I usually, when it's kind of off the edge like this, it makes it a little bit easier to get these on here. Okay, here we go. It wants to slip. There. is hard to do around this camera too. This is not going to be perfect because these aren't making very good contact because I'm not rolling this up tight enough. I can't get my fingers in there. There we go. off and it should behave itself while we finish it. some tape around it to just hold everything together temporarily. Now these are not capacitors you would want to use in a circuit. Uh, this is not a very good setup. But this at least kind of is a proof of concept and it'll show you the, how simple a capacitor really is uh, in its most basic form. So there is our new capacitor. And let's see what it does. And make and hopefully I didn't get it short get the electrodes shorted out. Nope, it's good. So if we look that one since we wind wound it a little bit tighter over top of itself and because it's got more surface area, instead of 2.2 nanofarads, it's 9.4 nanofarads. So just doubling the surface area of the electrodes and the insulators doesn't exactly uh, double the capacitance. It's really how tightly coupled the insulators and the elect electrodes are and how close they're spaced and how many times they're wound across one another all of those things affect the, uh, the performance of the capacitor. And you can see once again, theta is very similar. And if we change our frequency, there's one kilohertz. And just like the other capacitor, everything stays pretty close. Your capacitance drops a wee little bit. You can see even it set, and this thing only, that's one of the, the problems with this. It only can test up to 7.8 kilohertz. Uh, a really super high quality capacitor analyzer can test up to one megahertz or even higher, but those are many thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. So, but you can see R theta, it 
or your theta, I keep saying r theta, your theta is minus 89 degrees, which is very close to the ideal minus 90 degrees. So now let's look at a, the closest thing I have to this it would be a 10 nanofarad. So I got one of those out, and this is a mylar capacitor, and it's very similarly made to this. It has a mylar insulator instead of wax paper, and instead of just aluminum, it may have a different type of foil, some different alloy. But other than that, it's the same idea. If we connect it, we're right on 10 nanofarads which we would expect because it's a 10 nanofarad capacitor. Theta is very similar. Dissipation factor is almost nothing, which is good. And our parallel resistance is higher. It's a good bit higher. Just to, to go back and compare once again, you can see this is a good bit lower. Dissipation is still not that bad. Our Q <laughs> is a little bit lower. But everything else is pretty close. So this is pretty close to a factory capacitor, how it performs. Like I said, the Q is much higher. Interesting stuff. So this is, in fact, a capacitor. Now, if you're not sure what all these things mean, go back to my video that I did when I did the review on this uh, XJW01 uh, LCR meter. And I get into a lot of description of what all these factors are. They are actually important. Some are more important for the low value, uh, non-polarized type capacitors like these. And some are more important uh, with regard to electrolytic capacitors like this. And another thing that this does not test is dielectric uh, absorption. And uh, that's another whole thing. <laughs> but anyway, that's it.